Good evening, everyone. I'm Lynn Fridley, Program Coordinator for Maddie's Institute. The topic tonight is ringworm and how shelters are effectively treating this condition, and of course, how yours can too. At Maddie's Institute, we are committed to helping you find innovative, humane, and effective ways to keep animals happy and healthy while preparing them for placement in a new home. Dr. Karen Moriello, Clinical Associate Professor of Dermatology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine and a leading expert in the field, will give an overview of, uh, of information on ringworm and shelters, including best practices for treatment, disinfectant protocols, and how to manage and prevent outbreaks. But before we can get started, there are a few housekeeping items that we need to cover. Those of you attending tonight's webcast will be entered in a door prize drawing for one of five woods lamps, a critical tool in your battle against ringworm. In addition, five more names will be drawn for a copy of Maddie's Animal Shelter Infection Control Manual. We will contact the winners via email, so good luck. Next, please take a look at the left-hand side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you'll ask questions during the event. Dr. Moriello will answer as many questions as she can at the end of her presentation, but please submit your questions early. Questions submitted in the last few minutes will probably not be processed in time for a response. If you need any help with your connection during the presentation, you can click on the question mark, which is the help icon at the bottom of your screen, or you can go to event.on24.com slash view slash help. You will see other little images at the bottom of your screen along with the help button. These are widgets. The two green file widgets will take you to the resources that our presenter wanted to share with you as well as some shared by Maddie's Institute. The resources will also be available on our website after this presentation. So if you don't get to look at them during the event, don't worry. Before I turn things over to Dr. Moriello, I want to say a few words about Maddie's Fund. We are the nation's leading funder of shelter medicine education, and it's our goal to help save the lives of all of our nation's healthy and treatable shelter dogs and cats. The inspiration for this goal was a little dog named Maddie, who shared her unconditional love with Dave and Cheryl Duffield. They promised her that they would honor that love by founding Maddie's Fund, and helping make this country a safe and loving place for all of her kind. Please use what you learn here tonight to make the dream she inspired a reality. Dr. Moriello, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you very much for that very lovely introduction, Lynn. Um, I'd first like to thank Maddie for inviting me. I'm quite honored and flattered to be able to present my work. Uh, many of the things that you will be um, hearing about tonight have actually been funded um, by Maddie's through unrestricted gifts. Um, they've trusted me to answer the questions that shelters have asked. The second thing I'd like to do is thank everybody who's attended this evening because it's a Thursday night, it's a summer night, and you could be a lot of different places other than in front of your computer listening to talk, me talk about ringworm. So again, um, thank you very much. And so let's, let's get started. So oh, I'm waiting for the slide to go. All right. Everybody always asks me how I got into shelter medicine because really I was a lab rat. I was a clinical professor and I did treatment trials looking for best practices in treatment of, of cats, but from a clinical point of view. Well, one day one of our former students who was then the shelter um, veterinarian at the Dane County Humane Society said, I need to talk to you. I've got something going and I'd, I'd like you to really come out and, and, and see what I'm doing. And there was this pink trailer. And in this pink trailer was her dream, which was to start a treatment program um, on ringworm. And what she wanted to do is to show that it was a treatable and curable disease. And such launched a very long friendship and research association between Dr. Sandra Newberry and I, who's now at UC Davis, where we actually did a lot of the work and a lot of the studies that um, are published um, and have had to the, the privilege of, of helping a lot of cats. And this has actually gone on to, to become a model product of um, felines in training, courtesy um, and of the generosity of Maddie. So, you know, my life is all back to that pink trailer. I owe a lot to it. Well, let's get personal here. Um, everybody who's listening to this and everybody who does listen to this knows someone who has ringworm, and many of you probably maybe even do have ringworm. 
Um, ringworm is one of the most common skin diseases of people, and it's not a worm. It's actually a superficial fungal infection of the skin. It was called ringworm because the Romans and Greeks thought that it was, it was a worm because it would create a circular lesion. Well, in people, as you can see from the pictures, the most common place that people get it is on their nails and on their, uh, their toes. And obviously, um, it is more of a nuisance and a discomfort. So, you know, with that said, that begs the question of what is all the fuss about with ringworm in shelters? Really, what's the fuss about? Well, ringworm is a skin disease. So what about skin diseases in shelters? Well, first of all, we're microsporum canis. That's the primary pathogen that I'm going to talk about tonight. And that's really the pathogen that we have to worry about with ringworm. And all these years that it's been studied, there's really been no evidence to show that unlike other infectious agents, other viral agents, that it changes its pathogenicity. So we are not having you know, resistant ringworm. We don't have that, which is great. Um, it is truly, it is contagious and it is easily transmitted. Nobody will doubt that. But it's not a life-threatening disease. And the skin lesions, unlike some skin lesions, never cause long-term damage. And it's treatable and curable and it has a very good prognosis. When you consider all those points, it is really very similar to many other skin diseases that don't seem to scare us very much, such as chylotiella or walking dandruff, which is a mite, um, that flaky skin mite that a lot of itchy dogs get, particularly um, cocker spaniels are really notorious for that, or scabies, or ear mites, which we all know about, and fleas and ticks. And so it's in that group. These are all treatable, curable diseases and are more of a nuisance in one picture. However, um, again, why has ringworm risen to the point of being so important? And the primary reason that it is important in shelters is that it is a disease of public health concern, meaning it's a zoonotic disease, and it can go from animals to people and from people back to animals. It goes back and forth. Microsporum canis is very happy to live um, on the skin of any mammal. The other reason it's important is are the routine intake procedures that are done in shelters, such as vaccination, application of flea control products, dewormings, don't protect the population from ringworm unless there's a screening protocol in place. Another reason it's important is that it affects the most adoptable population in a shelter, kittens and puppies. And everybody knows that diseases that affect kittens and puppies are highly emotionally charged situations because of resources, because of the disease. Whatever you need to do when it involves kittens and puppies, there's a lot of emotion involved in it. And for those people that regrettably have had to deal with an outbreak of ringworm, you can probably tell me stories about what kind of a PR nightmare this can be. All right, so this gets to how common is it really? And again, there's a lot of mythology out there about it. Again, M. canis is the pathogen we're talking about. It's extremely variable in its geographic region. And it depends on the population density. It depends upon the husbandry practices. Um, intake procedures, socioeconomic areas, everything affects the, the prevalence of it. And when you get into the literature and if you start doctor Googling and looking at it, I do caution everybody who's listening to really be careful and look to see what are they talking about. Because there are reports of ringworm being prevalent from 4 to 100% of cats tested. And those are scary numbers. But what they're looking at in most of those studies are prevalence of culture positive status, not necessarily the disease. And just because a cat's culture positive does not mean that the cat is infected. It simply means it's culture positive. So you gotta really read between the lines on those particular um, studies. And another thing point I wanna make is that microsporum canis, cats are not, are often called the reservoir of infection. A reservoir is an organism that's found on every animal that's present. It's just there. Well, microsporum canis is not part of the normal flora, and I spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours testing cats to show that if you've got it, the cat was exposed to in a contaminated environment, or they're infected. They're not these reservoirs. 
And that's a big problem that a lot of physicians sometimes get um, owners very confused about. Now, transmission. Um, this is an actual um, picture from a shelter. And um, they had open housing. And it is a perfect situation for transmission. The most important transmission method is by direct contact, cat to cat. And sometimes it's a friendly cat-to-cat -cat interaction, and sometimes it's not so friendly cat-to-cat -cat interaction. But that is basically the way the disease is transmitted. An infected cat contacts a susceptible cat. Now, when you are training people or dealing with this disease, it's very important to understand actually how a lesion develops. Down in your corner there, you see this little yellow background with these little green marbles. Those are little spores or a cartoon of little spores. Um, and what ringworm starts out with are little spores on the hair. And so keeping that in mind, what happens is, is a cat that's infected meets a cat that's susceptible. And those spores have to contact the skin, which means that the areas where infections that are going to start are going to be the areas that are least haired. So that's why you see things around the ears and around the eyes and sometimes around the toes. Um, spores must stick or adhere to the skin. And once they get there, then they have a battle. First, they have to defeat the cat. And the cat's main defense against everything is grooming. And cats can groom their skin, so their hair coat so well that when you culture lots of cats in screenings, what you will end up with is no growth on your culture plate. They're really good at it, OK? So that's the number one thing. If they beat the cat, they then have to beat the skin defense mechanisms of the skin immune system. Once they get through all of that, they're good if they have a nice little place to grow. And that nice little place to grow is microtrauma to the epidermal skin barrier. So they need some kind of a scratch, something that gives them a little bit of serum or a little bit of moisture. Because what they have to do is germinate. And so it's a little spore, and it just lays there, and it's dormant until it gets the right temperature and some moisture, and then it will start to germinate. And the time that it takes from contact and germination to an actual lesion that you can see in your shelter on a cat is 14 to 21 days. If you look at cats every day during the infection, you can see it a lot sooner if you know exactly where the spores are. But for practicality, it's 14 to 21 days. And very importantly, um, microsporum canis can only live in the skin. Okay. So field studies on risks. Everybody always asks me, what's the risk? What's the risk? Well. You know, this is real-world data, 8,000 cult fungal cultures from various shelter cats. And we looked at, at data from them, and about 628 were, were culture positive. And then we looked at the things that everybody was asking me about. You know, what about the age? What about the sex, hair length, presence of lesions? And very importantly, source um, surrender versus stray. You know, can I use any of this information? And what we found quite expectedly, was that if a cat was younger, they were more likely to be culture positive. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying they're infected, but more likely to be culture positive. If they had hair that was longer, they were more likely to be culture positive. And if you think of a cat and linoleum or a shag rug, it's easier to clean linoleum than it is to clean a shag rug. So those cats that have got long hair, it's harder to clean yourself. And if a cat has lesions, it's more likely to be culture positive. More lesions, especially if they're indications of bites. What was really interesting was is that you can't really use a surrender or a stray as a very good indicator for looking for a, a risk factor, because it, it just really um, was not statistically significant. Okay. Now, with that in mind, there are some things that are important about um, talking about aiding the disease in being transmitted. So what really helps it start an infection? Well, the number one thing that helps start an infection is a cat that can't groom for any reason, because this is its natural protective behavior. And those cats can be not grooming for, for many reasons, um, behavioral reasons, what's going on in the room, a cat that has arthritis, a cat that's injured, a cat that won't eat. Any reason is important. And so one thing that you can do is, is help these cats groom and get them grooming again. Skin trauma from bites, scratches, ectoparasites, that's why that in-house intake treatment for parasites is so important. Matted hair coats um, act like little bandages and protective areas for the spores to sit underneath. And they're protected from the cat. Moisture collects there. Uh, dampness. Um, you know, Cleaning is necessary in a shelter. But dampness, 
is a really big um, aid to spores germinating because they need that. So you have to watch the humidity in that. Cats in poor body condition uh, and debilitating or concurrent diseases, and obviously, you know, the age extremes. And then we have, you know, this black hole called stress in a cat. And cats can sit there looking at you in a cage and be really stressed. And the stress affects the skin immune system. So that battle occurring at the skin level, you know, may actually be, you know, really um, adversely affected by stress. So those, all those things that you do for the general well-being of a cat are really helpful for this disease. And then there's some things that most people don't even think about. These spores are, are tiny and small, like dust. And if you have a situation where there's a lot of flying and biting insects around um, that go from one cat to another cat, um, they can carry uh, spores on them. And there are publications that have documented house flies that are positive for microsporum canis that have been trapped and captured in areas where there's been infected cats. Um, and so they can spread spores. Cats with light um, are one. And of course, my all-time favorite are fleas. Um, I oftentimes get cultures from um, shelters in Florida, and those shelters invariably are toothbrush cultures, and they have hair and spores and fleas. And fleas are pretty tough. They usually can live through the transport. And every time I find them, what I do is I culture them. And if the cat is uh, culture positive, so are the fleas. So here you have infected spores on a little bitty tiny flea, and it's an, a little creature that causes biting and scratching, and so it's actually really helpful for the transmission of the disease. So flea control is really you know, a very key thing that you can do, which helps in so many things, and in particularly in helping minimize outbreaks and infection. So in talking about environmental contamination, I think it's really important. This is a, a something which is like terrifying. I mean, everyone's like worried about environmental contamination as if it's like radioactive material. So let's actually like, you know, break it down. So the first thing up there in the left-hand corner is a cat with an inflamed ear. And that actually is a kitten with ringworm. And hairs, when they're infected, are very, very fragile. And they break off. And so what they end up doing is dropping off right below there, following that arrow, into the hair. And so you've got hair and debris and dirt in the environment, and that's environmental contamination. Well, what does that look like if you take it a little bit smaller? Well, if you go up into the middle slide there, what you see are some very wide brown hairs. And those are infected hairs picked up from the environment. And that's looking at them microscopically. And then blowing them up, the far right-hand slide, what you see there is a hair with what looks like little balls all up and down it. And those little balls are ectothrix spores, the naturally infected state of, of uh, the cat's hair uh, of the disease, microsporum canis. And when one of those little spores falls into the environment, and if you catch it with a swiffer when you're doing cultures and that and put it on a culture plate, it will grow into a colony. So every little spore is conceivably a little tiny microsporum canis colony. And that's all from environmental contamination. That's what it is, those hairs and those spores. Now, the known risk about environmental contamination, um, what is the problem with it? Well, the major problem with environmental contamination is that it causes confounding culture results. You can take and get culture-positive cats, and you don't know if the environment is contaminated, whether or not this cat has an infection or whether it's just a fomite or, or dust mop carrier. That's the problem. And that can really be a big problem when you're in, in, having a treatment program or you're trying to decide whether or not to treat. Because toothbrush cultures cannot distinguish between these fomite or dust mop carriers and truly infected cats. Now, I and many other people have, have stated that infected spores in the environment serve as a source for susceptible animals and people. If you've got a lot of debris and dirt in a shelter area, especially the things that are hidden underneath a corner someplace, and you have a susceptible cat, um, sure, that's a possible source. What about people? Well, I spent a lot of time um, looking for a documented case, and I'm sure they're out there, but to find a published one was kind of a, you know, a, a search. It's like a scavenger hunt, and I actually found one. And it was a five-year-old boy who got microsporum canis, ringworm, from the inside of a car, a second-hand car. 
and it turned out that the previous owner of the car had a dog with ringworm and uh, contaminated the inside of it. But I haven't been able to find too many other ones. So, you know, really the people who are going to be most at risk are going to be the people that are cleaning, where that might be, you know, contacting this material, and if they're following, you know, appropriate um, practices that you do when you're dealing with any kind of biological material in a shelter, feces, urine, they're going to be protected. Um, so, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, cause widespread disease by itself. It's a risk factor, but the bigger problem is that it confounds culture results. Now, on to more myths about spores in the environment. Fungal spores only grow in skin. Now, when I would talk to people and I'd say, okay, you know, you can have environmental contamination, their eyes would get really big and they'd say, say things to me like, you mean it's in my house? I never quite understood that, you know, what the panic was until one day it dawned on me that people were thinking of ringworm as the, the slide on the right, the black mold in my house, growing in the walls, destroying things. No, that does not happen. Ringworm, microsporum canispores, are like M&Ms. Whatever falls out of the bag, that's all you got. So whatever falls off the cat, that's all you have. They do not multiply, which is great because it is a weapon. It is a step that you can use to your advantage to break the transmission, um, to break this disease in your particular um, shelter. Now, um, another little uh, thing that I was able to hunt down that was always of interest to me, um, early on in my career, I um, actually was helping somebody decontaminate a home and cultured their heating vent. And it was full of cat hair and full of microsporum canispores and came up positive. And so I started talking about how, um, you know, you can have, you know, fungal spores in the furnace in that. And so, you know, this, you know, obviously was something I found and believed to be true. Well, the pink trailer came about. And I thought, you know, it would really be great. That was a one-time thing. It would really be great if I could go ahead and prove it. So what I did is um, in my little pink trailer, they did routine cleaning. I went in there in the middle of winter time when there was a lot of cats up in there, and I put fungal culture plates directly over the heating vents and let the hot air blow on there, thinking I was inoculating them with plates, with spores, took them to my laboratory, and nothing grew. So I thought, oh, well, you know, it must have got cold in the car ride over. So I went and repeated it a couple times, and it was always culture negative, you know. And um, I looked in there, and I thought, well, there's no hairs or anything like that, and, you know, and I, couldn't, I couldn't find any spores. So I started thinking, well, where are these spores going? So then I went to the furnace filter, and lo and behold, what was happening was is the furnace filter in that little trailer was just pulling the hairs in. They had good enough furnace filters. They were trapping the hairs in there, and those furnace filters were always culture positive. They were trapping the infected hairs and spores. And so here's, again, you know, something that you can use to your advantage is to use something like really good furnace filters to trap those hairs. And if you keep your vents clean and you have your furnace filters functioning, that, again, is another big step. I have to eat a little crow over here because, you know, I was telling people that, oh, well, you know, it's blowing around. Well, it's not blowing around. It's getting trapped in the furnaces, especially if you're cleaning your vents. So, and again, that was a little study that um, with a little bit of fun, help from Maddie's, I was able to, uh, to do. All right. Well, it looks like um, we have a poll question coming up. This is your chance in the audience to give us some feedback. And the question is, what disinfectant do you use for ringworm in general? And here we go. We've got bleach 1 to 10. 50% of the people responding said that they use that. Bleach 1 to 32 or 1 to 100 is 19%. Uh, uh, trifectant, 14%. Accelerated hydrogen peroxide, about 5%. Other, 7%. Seven, 7%. And five people said it was not applicable. So those are pretty interesting answers. And that must and, be my cue. And that is your cue. <laughs> okay, yes. all right. Um, well, that is really interesting. And bleach is really something that um, has been found to be very, very effective. And it is really commonly used um, anywhere between um, 1 to 10 to 1 to 100. 
and it's used for a lot of reasons, um, particularly because it's inexpensive and it's, and it's effective. Well, um, one of the things that was coming up a lot and, uh, is, you know, is there an alternative to bleach? Because, you know, bleach has some issues with it. Um, you have to prepare it. It can break down. Um, it can cause um, chemical injury. Um, and it obviously can be very hard on your equipment and, and uh, other things in the shelter. So um, the three studies that um, I did this year, uh, just this year, um, were to kind of look at alternatives to it, look at some aspects of cleaning and on disinfectants. Well, I was getting, um, you know, my email was getting just flooded with questions about accelerated hydrogen peroxide. And I wasn't very excited about testing it because, Many years ago, when it first hit the market, and many people probably don't realize it, because they're not as old as I am, there was a form of accelerated hydrogen peroxide, and it didn't test very well. And I thought, well, let me go back and see, you know, and that product was no longer on the market, but I looked to see how I tested it, and I thought, well, that was a pretty hard test that I did. I mean, basically, we took a bunch of infected cat hairs, um, a lot of infected cat hairs, and exposed it to um, the product, and obviously it failed. And I said, well, you know, that's really not what I'm preaching right now. What I'm preaching right now is to properly prepare an area, get rid of all that debris there. So what, what, what would it do if I actually looked at it um, on a properly prepared area? And this study is going to be presented in just two weeks at the World Congress of Veterinary Dermatology, and it is um, basically an in vitro study. I mean, it's in the lab. But what we did is we took um, a, uh, a small quantity of infected spores, about one milliliter, about a half of a fifth of a teaspoon, and um, mix it with nine mils of accelerated hydrogen peroxide, various products out there, and found that it, I was very surprised that it was very effective. And we were doing it under optimum circumstances, maximum you know, contact in a little test tube, of course, and uh, for 10 minutes. And that really surprised me. And that made me feel like, well, you know, this is really something that I need to pursue in vivo. So for those of you that were actually using accelerated hydrogen peroxide, you know, we may be able to tell you, you know, um, in six months or a year, you know, under what are the optimum circumstances. Now, I know that there's a shampoo out there, and I know there's a fungal rinse. We've not looked at those things. We've just looked at the things that were available for um, disinfectants. And, and there are some products out there that are actually used for, for sterilization products. But um, this, this might be an option, and it's, it's a nice option if it, if it works. Well, that got me kind of interested in because I get a second set of emails all the time. It's like, well, do I always have to buy, use bleach or buy something? Isn't there something I can buy over the counter? And so um, Dr. Darcy Kunder, who's presenting this at the World Congress, went to a big box store to remain unnamed and went and looked at um, all everything that was there and chose eight products that said that they were effective against trichophytons, brought them back to the laboratory, and what we did in this little experiment is we took a milliliter of infected spores, um, about 400 infected spores, which is you know about what we would figure would be on an environment uh, that was properly cleaned. And then um, we did one or two tests, very scientific. We spritzed it with just one pump of the product out of the bottle or five pumps out of the bottle. So basically, we did a kind of a spritz versus a very thorough application. And we were very pleased to find out that there are a lot of commercial products out there that when applied liberally to a, to a prepared surface and allowed to get maximum contact time were very efficacious against microsporum canis. So we may be able to actually, again, come up with a lot of alternatives that are cost effective and easy to get. Now, one thing that's really important here about um, the use of disinfectants is to understand how they work. What they do is they break down the wall of the, of the spore. So they need that 10-minute contact time to denature it or break it down. So that's really important. In a third study that was done um, by another um, trainee of mine looked at how, you know, in a hospital, in our veterinary hospital, we have about 20,000 animals. We have no surveillance whatsoever for ringworm. Derm has a ringworm coming in. Our primary care does. And our hospital director was like, well, you know, is it running around the hospital? Do, do we have a problem? Do we need to do something? And so every week for 52 weeks, he, he swiffered randomly 13 different sites um, for ringworm spores. And I'm happy, really 
happy to tell you that the routine cleaning that we did and just washing of the floors, we, we did not have ringworm throughout the hospital in any area. The only time we found ringworm was when it was um, associated with an actual patient that came in. So if a patient came in, we found a positive area, we were able to directly trace it back to where a patient had been. And that basically told us if, you know, we make a diagnosis, we have to do a little bit better job of cleaning, but it didn't track through the entire building. So here, you know, the bottom line here is that, you know, you can kind of predict where you might have a problem, which I thought was really, really a piece of good information for everyone. Okay, evidence to date. Basically, what we know for controlling dermatophytosis is that environmental control needs to be constant and continual. And if it's all you can do in your shelter, because everybody has different limitations, it is a lot. It's a huge amount. And the two most important steps are aggressive removal of debris, hair and debris, and aggressive scrubbing with a detergent. Even spick and span is what I'm talking about. And then rinsing with clean water. And the reason you have to rinse with clean water and then allow the area to dry before you do anything more is that um, a lot of disinfectants are inactivated by detergents. And they also don't work when there's debris. So you want the area to look like the part on, on the right-hand side there you're looking at, where it looks pretty clean and, all, and it's been pre-cleaned. And that's what you want it to look like. So somebody's out there probably saying, I don't believe her. And that's good. I like, I like skeptics. But back to the pink trailer, um, at one time we decided to actually look at this. In the middle of summer, when we had anywhere from about 17 to 30 cats over an eight-week period, we kept track of the cats that were under treatment. They were doing regular just mechanical removal, sweeping, mopping, and disinfectant with bleach like everyone was using, um, one to ten, twice a week. And then we cultured 20 different sites. And we didn't tell people what sites we were culturing, and we didn't tell people that we were doing this. And the blue line at the bottom shows the number of positive sites. And every positive site, you know, we rarely, only at one time over there at week four did we have more than five positive sites. And they were predictable places. If someone used a, um, a gown and didn't dispose of it and we happened to culture it, it was culture positive. But, or if it was a, a new kitten and the outside of the cage was there and the kitten was just in there, we were and it was highly infected, we were able to find a culture positive site. But the routine cleaning did not, we did not have spores all over the place. So basically, this really shows that with routine cleaning, you can do a lot. All right. Now, so what do you need to do? I am infamous for clutter busting. Clutter busting is the way to go. So the first thing everybody needs to do is ask for clean, um, clear plastic um, containers with lockable lids, get in your shelter, and if you don't need it, get rid of it. If you can put it in a container, do it. And, and I'm talking newspapers, blankets, everything. Because clean it, scrub it, and that makes your life so much easier. If you can't put up a barrier or a door, you can surely put up a clear um, shower curtain, as you can see on the right-hand side. When you're looking in your cat rooms, get rid of those trees. They're problems. You need to provide enrichment for your cats. You need to have height. Think creatively. In this particular shelter, they put milk crates on the wall. Pretty high, as a matter of fact. Cats are pretty good at it. And they designed them. Um, a really clever volunteer did it so that they could actually take them off the wall and put them back on and, and wash them. And uh, they found plastic containers that were big enough to actually scrub them with. And it, it was really great. And, and the cats really, really liked them. So clutter bus is a big deal. Now, next thing is, is just that mechanical thing. It's like Grandma used to say, you know, sweep, sweep, sweep. The thing that I want to make an emphasis about is that there is no magic disinfectant, and that includes bleach, and bleach does not have a residual effect. It has no force field. So after you use it, that surface could easily become contaminated again. Basically, any cat-safe disinfectant will fail if the area is not properly prepared. End of discussion. It will fail. The spores are protected from contact with the disinfectant by dirt, debris, and the hair shaft. It has to penetrate into them. So you have to really get in there and be aggressive. And then you must rinse them with clean water, and you need to allow it to dry before a disinfectant is applied. So in disinfectant, the purpose of a disinfectant is essentially 
is to go ahead and kill the few spores that you couldn't sweep or scrub away. Now, to make things easier, it really helps to have staff-friendly cleaning tools. And some of the things in this slide are not necessarily things you want to use all over your shelter, but maybe in the areas that really do need to have to be cleaned every single day or maybe a couple times a day, like adoptable rooms where people are coming in and out where you really want to be sure that they're clean. Um, I'm, I'm actually famous for recommending Swiffers, and I like them very much, and Generic works just as well as the routine brand. One of my favorite new things is something called the 3M Easy Trap Duster, and it's like a Swiffer, and it comes in a big roll, but it's sticky, and it is great. It picks up hairs and spores and everything. You can pull it off to any length that you want, so it's, it's great. And then in rooms that you want to clean, or where um, buckets are more problematic, I'm a huge fan of flat mop tools. And these are like a lot like the um, you know, Swiffer wet jets, except they're more economical because they're reusable. Um, they come with a handle that has a pad that um, it Velcros on, and you can wash these. Um, they're indestructible. I bought six for my house, and I've had them for the last 10 years, and I wash them two or three times a week. Um, so they're tough. And what you can do is it, um, this kind of Swiffer handle, uh, the uh, scrub um, model here, has a little cartridges um, that are empty, and you could put your detergent in there, you could put your, um, your disinfectant in there, you squeeze, you squirt it out and mop it, and it works great. And I first encountered this um, flat mop tool in uh, isolation wards used in human hospitals. So I thought that's a nifty tool for a lot of areas in a shelter. Um, or even even in homes. It's really great. All right, so when you go to apply your disinfectant, which is your third step, read the label. And if you're looking for a product, um, based on the preliminary results that we're finding, look for something that's been tested against trichophyton metagophytes, because trichophyton is the pathogen model, uh, is the pathogen that's required um, when they test disinfectants to get label claim. And we found that if it was effective against trichophyton, it also killed M. canis. Um, we're going to do some more in vivo studies, but right now that, you know, is, is pretty much um, was consistent. Um, and then one thing I do want to caution you about are these products out there that are, that are claiming or salesmen that are claiming that it is one-step products. There is no such thing as a one-step product. You have to remove the debris, and if you read the labels closely, you will see that. And then you must, again, soak the area and keep it wet for at least five to ten minutes because it has to have time to contact the spores and essentially kill them. Okay, clinical signs. Um, clinical signs, the purpose of these slides is just to show you um, not what you already know, but just to show you again that the, the clinical lesions end up developing where the cat has thinner hair and where lesions can develop. And this cat is around the eyes where the spores can adhere is where you're going to start seeing lesions. Big thing in kittens the ears and the face, um, you know, very subtle places around the eyes. You may not even real see this unless you used a wood lamp or another really great tool is a white flashlight. Paws, this little um, kitten up there with the lesion on the paw obviously um, had a lesion up around its face that matched where the lesion was on the paw. Or on the abdomen or the belly And some kittens, you know, they chew and they bite, they're going after fleas, um, and they'll, they'll inoculate themselves there. And then ears. Ears are a great place to look, inside the bell of the ear. You shouldn't have little vesicles as, as you do up in the upper left-hand corner. You may just have thin hairs. You may have no hair. Or you may have crusty lesions. If anybody's ever seen a cat like in the lower left-hand side, that's a cat with a trichophyton. And that's what ears look like that, come from, that have got ringworm cats from farms where they have trichophyton. I don't worry much about trichophytons because they don't really go ripping through a shelter like M. canis could. But... You know, that is one thing that uh, to keep in mind. One thing that is important that might be a little bit new are Rex cats and dermatophytosis. These guys have got a really tight coat, and there's an increasing number of reports of difficulty in treating these cats, more so than long-haired cats, because their coat is really tight, and it's very, very difficult to get the topical application of the material down to um, the hair shaft. And then when you clip them, you can see the extent of the lesions, the cat on lesions are clipped on the left, and they can have so many spores that if you do a skin scraping and just put a little stain on there, 
um, you might see those little dots over there. That's not bacteria. Those are spores that we stained. And so these cats are, are more of a concern to me right now because they're becoming more popular than um, even long-haired cats. Okay. And then you can just have odd and weird dramatic lesions. The upper cat in the upper hand corner was the victim of a fight. Obviously, there's a lot of serum and blood there. Spores got there, and the poor cat had two problems. Um, something going on in the abdomen of this cat and exposed um, to ringworm and developed lesions. Um, kittens, sometimes some of you may have seen kittens with these little ulcer-like lesions on the lip. Anything that causes a damage to the lip can cause this lesion. In this particular case, I know for a fact that this kitten had one infected hair there, one infected hair from uh, during our study, and we saw it, and I watched it and develop, and I watched it heal, and I watched that little lesion develop, and I thought, wow, Maybe that's what was there in some of these cats that had these one-time unilateral little lip lesions. Maybe they had a little bit of a uh, of, of ringworm there. Now, we all have our long-haired cat stories, and what I want to emphasize is that in the fold of these cats, if you've got a long-haired cat and they've got problems, you may need to be culturing between the folds or trying to get better treatment in there because that where is you can have that can harbor infection. And then you have mechanical carriers. The long-haired cats, those fomite carriers, you know, like, may I, can you meet the dust mop? Well, that's who those guys are. They can be mechanical carriers. And you don't know, are they truly infected or are they mechanical carriers? Well, everyone has heard this statement. It's ringworm until proven otherwise. And what I want to tell you is, oh, no, it's not. Back to the pink trailer. In this pink trailer, we looked at um, 5,644 cultures over a 24-month period. And we looked at culture positive. And 10% were culture positive. And that's a really scary number. However, we started digging through the data. 381 of them had skin lesions. That's like 6.75%. 6 that's still a pretty big number. But only 94 of that whole group of cats were both lesional and culture positive, And when a veterinarian examined them, were found to be infected. So really, out of like that huge number of cats, only 1.6% had ringworm, not 10.3. 1.6% we can deal with. 10.3, you know, that's a scary number. So again, that comes back to at the very beginning when I was talking about, you know, what is the prevalence? Are we talking culture positive or are we talking actual infection? And that's really what needs to be documented. Another take-home point here is that only one of four um, cats with skin lesions actually had dermatophytosis. And a lot of these cats that had the dermatophytosis were in populations that you would expect, which were young cats. So when you're beating ringworm, the only way you can really know what, what you've got is you have to put a screening program into place. And for those of you that don't have a screening program, don't feel bad. There's a lot you can do and a lot you can eventually you know, think about maybe implementing. But the reasons for it is because it's a disease that's involved public safety. It helps prevent outbreaks. It helps keep your foster homes safe. It can be a life or death decision in some situations on, on how cats are managed. And because there really is no other way to know, you can't just look at a cat and say, you know, without doing some type of diagnostic test, is it ringworm? And screening, there's a lot of parts of screening that um, are important, and there's some that you can do even if you can't afford to do cultures. Okay. What have you got as your tools? Your basic tools in a shelter are physical exam, woods lamp, a direct exam of hair, and for a lot of these, fungal cultures. And, and the things in yellow are on-site cost-effective tools. Some of the things I'm going to tell you is go buy a flashlight. Look at these cats under bright, bright light, intense light, because that's really important. And get a woods lamp, because there's a lot you can do with that. Oh, here we are. And we have another poll question. This poll question is, what best describes your use of a woods lamp in your shelter? Okay, here we go. All right. I don't have a woods lamp. 27% of the folks out there in our audience don't have a woods lamp. I have one, but I don't use it because I'm not sure what I'm looking for. That's only 2%. I have one and I use it only when cats have skin lesions. 45%. Uh, I have one and I use it as part of the intake screening process. 13%. I need training on how to use a woods lamp. That's 3% and not applicable is 10%.
That's very, very interesting stuff. Right. So that's really helpful. Um, for those of you who don't have a woods lamp, I'd like you to get involved in this drawing and get one. And for those of you that do have a woods lamp and use it on skin lesions, I'm going to show you how you can actually do a whole lot better with it. And I want to eat some crow here, um, and figuratively, obviously. Um, the comment has been made that only 50% of strains of microsporum canis glow. Um, and that actually is something I have said until I one day decided, you know, I'm going to track that down because I need it for reference for a book. And I tracked it down, and I was surprised to find out that it traces back to a statement made by a human dermatologist about its use in people because uh, wood lamps aren't very helpful in people because people bathe and they change things. Whoa. <laughs> so um, I thought, wow. So we went back to shelters and looked at uh, data. Again, another field study. And here's what we found when we looked at a lot of data that um, we're co compiling for pu um, publication. Fomite carrier cats don't glow because it's just those spores are just sitting on their coats. Infected, untreated cats with true ringworm lesions glow very, very commonly, and they glow bright green. So um, it is a useful, useful tool. The woods lamp is your friend, um, and, I, and, I, and I, I find it, I think it's something, you know, no matter what you're doing, if you, it should be part of your intake procedure because um, it can provide you with so much valuable information. So a cat comes in that lesions, you don't know what it is, and you put a woods lamp on it. If the woods lamp glows, you can definitely do direct exams. Um, using a woods lamp on every single cat when they come in will often uncover lesions you will not find with bright light. Um, using a flashlight on cats will oftentimes find lesions, light lesions that you won't fight. That's why on CSI, everybody kind of laughs with the little people running around with the flashlights, you know, and they're, why don't you turn on the lights? Well, it's because things under a spotlight oftentimes show up. Well, a woods lamp is a lot like that, and woods lamps are really good, and sometimes you have to look under crust, and you do need to look for several minutes, but this is a really important part, and if you're trying to break a cycle of ringworm, not have ringworm in your shelter, get everybody trained with how to do a woods lamp. You're going to be very happy that you did it because it's going to be able to intervene a lot quicker. And one of the things you need to understand, well, what makes a woods lamp hair, woods lamp, you know, hair glow? And it's because as that little hair is glow, growing in the hair, it produces a metabolite on its surface, which glows green under the light. And all you need to do is pluck it in the direction of growth and put it on a slide and drop a mineral oil. Contrary to popular belief, you do not need to have those fancy clearing agents which destroy microscope lenses. You can definitely get that glowing hair, look at it under a microscope, and confirm the presence of an infection with that. All right. And now it looks like we're back to you, Lynn. Okay. We have our third poll question of the night. Regarding doing direct examinations of glowing hairs, which of the following best describes you? And here's our results. Regarding doing direct examination of glowing hairs, which of the following best describes you? I do not perform direct exams of glowing hairs. It's 45%. I've tried to perform direct exams of glowing hairs and have been frustrated. Only 12%. I can do it, but it takes too much time. 4%. I need training on how to do this procedure. 33%. I do it routinely and feel confident. Oh, 0.1%. Oh, well, maybe, um, Dr. Moriello, you would have uh, some Bet. advice for some folks on this one. Absolutely. I can help. <laughs> I can absolutely help here. <gasps> All right. So what you're looking at here is a direct exam. And what you, I really want to encourage people to do this. This is not a difficult technique. It does take a little bit of practice, and all you need is a nice litter of uh, infected kittens to do it. Um, and I think we need to go back to one slide here. Oh. Um, and we're, ah, there we go. We're all together now. Okay. So what you're seeing here are some big brown hairs that are wide, and this is under 10X, in mineral oil from a cat with ringworm, and these are infected hairs. The rest of them are normal. Infected hairs on a woods lamp 
from a wood that you plug from a wood lamp are uh, pale, wider, and filamentous looking. They are easy to recognize. Now, for those people um, you know who um, want to do more about this, um, I've put uh, links up to several um, uh, resources on direct exams, on, on how to do wood lamp exams um, in the resources section. But briefly, your wood lamp, again, is your friend in the laboratory. Because one of the big problems with finding um, infected hairs is you know you, you plucked it, but then you can't find it on the slides. You don't know where you're finding to look for it. So all you need to do is just remember, if it glowed on the cat and it, it's going to glow in mineral oil, you can take it to the laboratory, put it on your microscope slide, hold your wood lamp off to the slide, turn the lights off, and lo and behold, you can see in the bottom slide a little glowing speck. And that is the glowing hairs. And then you just simply need to go ahead and move your microscope um, ocular lenses and into the field so that you can see it through the ocular pieces. And what you're looking at in the upper right-hand corner is what it looks like when you are looking at infected hairs um, under the microscope with a wood lamp shining on them. And then you just go back to the normal view, and you look and you go, oh, look, there's that slide. And do this a couple of times, and you will absolutely be able to be very comfortable in finding them. And if you are find some of these, you can just put nail polish on the edges of it and make a permanent mount, and you can use it for training. Uh, another way of finding these infected slides is to add a little bit of numethylene blue to your um, mineral oil because the hairs are kind of porous because they're all broken up, and it will pick up the stain. And that will be a way of helping you find it. But you know, this is in the resources, and I really encourage people, if you're doing a wood lamp and you've got it, do it because this confirms infection. For medical and legal reasons, you, you can do a culture to absolutely find out, um, you know, to confirm that it's microsporum canis. But right now, right here, the cat's in front of you. You can start treatment with confidence. And we're back to Lynn. And we have the next poll question. When do you do fungal cultures in your shelter? And the results are? Only when cats have suspected lesions, it's 59%. Um, in select group of cats and on cats with suspected lesions, 6%. Six, 6 Never, 18%. As part of the intake screening protocol, 5%. And not applicable, 12%. Okay. So, thank you very much. Um, all right. So. Um, you don't have to do fungal cultures on every single cat um, if that's not within your capabilities, but definitely doing them when you've got lesions and you want to know is great. So whether you're doing fungal cultures as a routine screening procedure or whether you're doing them on suspected lesions, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And in training, one of the things you need to really emphasize to staff, because sometimes I will actually get um, the um, – an infected cat and get a negative culture, and I'll go back and I'll look at the, at the toothbrushes because I keep them and there's no hair in there. And so pretty much when I train, it's 20 strokes on the cat or until there's lots of hair in the bristles. If the cat's got lesions, culture all the other areas first and then go back to it. Where a lot of lesions um, show up um, and, or, or when you miss culture positive cats is not culturing the face, the bell of the ear, the eyes, and the digits. Now, if you are doing fungal cultures and you're setting them up right away, right after you take them, um, this slide may not apply to you. But if you're storing them and, and setting them up later, it does. Where after you take that fungal culture, you don't want to have walk around your shelter with a fungal culture, you know, full of infected hairs. What you want to do is put it in a cheap plastic sandwich bag, the kind with the little fold. Just wrap it up in there and put it in, a, in another um, bag to double bag it until you set up your cultures or to send it to the laboratory because that helps protect it. And double bagging then allows you um, or whoever's taking it out to go ahead and to take um, the slide, there we go, to be able to go reach in there and take the toothbrush out of the plastic bag and safely handle it without pulling spores all the way through and all over the counter. In, in this example, the person doesn't have gloves on, the toothbrush isn't wrapped, and they pull that out. I can guarantee you if there's spores, they're going to end up everywhere. 
Another thing is you'll notice that there's a white sheet of paper there. It's not there for photographic purposes. It's actually just a paper towel that's been dampened with a disinfectant to trap any spores that fall down. Now, if you're doing in-house cultures, um, and you definitely can, I strongly suggest that um, if you're not culturing your, your um, inoculating your plates this way, this may be a better way of doing it to prevent cross-contamination. Always use a little wet drop cloth to collect spores. Hold your plate upside down and inoculate it by stabbing the bristles um, in it until you have yellow. You want to color the entire surface, but you definitely want to hold the plate upside down. What you don't want to do is this. Inoculate it with the plate open because you're going to be spewing spores all over the place. Um, the other method will contain it. And I do thousands of cultures every year, and we monitor all the time for contamination. And the upside down method really works. Now, one of the things which is very important to understand is red. What does a fungal culture tell you? The only way you can really confirm an infection is by doing a microscopic exam. You can't go by the color indicator. Red does not mean it's it. Red simply means look at me. Dermatophyte test media is the most common medium used, and dermatophyte test media has a color indicator in there which simply flags the colonies that might be important to look at. And one of the most confusing products on the market is Rapid Vet D, which says, oh, well, if it's, you know, you put if you put something on there and it turns red, it's positive. Well, that test is really for only looking at woods lamp positive hairs. It really isn't applicable to being used in shelters um, because you can't use it in do toothbrush cultures, and it can get you a lot of false results. Now, dermatified test medium again is something that is the most is the one you want to buy, and it's not hard to use. You're simply looking for a pale or a white colony with a red ring of color developing around it as it grows. You ignore any colony that doesn't have a red ring of color. You ignore any colony that's heavily pigmented. And you focus on the one that is pale and white with a red ring of color around it. And yeah, it's really that simple to do. Those are the ones you want to do. And you can go through you know, 50 or 60 cultures really quickly and only have five or six plates to look at if you use that sorting system, and that is described in your, in your method. People ask me what to buy. There's lots of stuff on the market. It's very simple. Don't buy things that are made for people, which was the in tray, because it's made for people, not for cats. Buy products that have a lot of culture medium on it, a lot of volume, and incubate them at higher temperatures. And in your resources, I actually can show you and discuss how to make a little incubator and how to monitor that. But again, you want to use something that you can easily inoculate with a plate. Another thing I get a lot of call, uh, calls on is, do I need to use the dual plates? And what is a dual plate? A dual plate is one that has got two different types of culture medium on them. The red here is dematified test media. The other one doesn't have a color indicator. The advantage of a dual plate is that with DTM, you get the nice flag of the red which is great. It tells you you can look at it. Um, the advantage of having the other growth media is that it gives you what the colony really looks like normally. Now, here is the situation. When the color indicator is added to the media, it changes the way the organism grows grossly and microscopically. These two colonies, these two sides of the plate, don't look the same, and that's because the color indicator changes it. So you, know, you can definitely don't have to buy it, but if you do, be aware that one of the advantages um, of using the one that doesn't have a color indicator is you can actually sometimes find those spores that you're looking for. And as an aside, I want to point out to you that once your media turns all red, the whole little red flag business of looking at me is lost. You then have to look at everything. And what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for canoes. And this presentation doesn't allow enough time to talk about all the cool things about microsporum canis. But um, when you set up and do micros microscopic exams, you need to do that and go have a cup of coffee. Then you come back, and your stain will suck up into the little spores, and it'll make it a lot easier to find the canoes. And the key features are those thick walls that you're looking for. And there are pictures posted on your resources for you to print out so that you can use as a model. But that's what's really, really important. Now, 
one of the things if people have been following any of the work that Dr. Newberry's published is the P scoring system. And this is a pathogen scoring system. And basically it's really simple. In developing a way of trying to communicate, you know, how many spores are on a plate to shelters, we had to come up with some kind of a of a method. And it occurred to me, you know, that we would just use colony forming units and sort of score them one to three, with three being the worst. Because positive and negative simply doesn't tell us enough information. And a good example of this is this slide here, which is our P scoring slide as an example. All of these are positive. And all these cats, if they were sent to a laboratory, would come back as having microsporum canis. And I can tell you, only one cat here does, and that's the cat on the bottom where the whole plate's covered. The other two cats were fomite carriers. And so positive is really hard. You really need to know how many colonies are there because it really becomes very helpful. It becomes helpful in monitoring therapy. It becomes helpful if you're trying to look at decontamination. I'm telling you, if you take a room that's gone and it's all red like on the bottom and you clean it up and you're just getting a few colonies, you are doing a really good job. It's also really good to use the P-scoring system when you're monitoring cats because it does give you sort of a visual of how well the cats are doing. Some of the examples on using the P-system, how do we do it? What do we do with it? Well, the important thing about a fungal culture when you've got those results in your hand, is it doesn't tell you what's going on with your cat today. What it's telling you is what's going on with the cat two weeks ago. So two weeks ago you took this fungal culture, and two weeks ago this is what was growing on it. So now you go to the cat, because you've got a positive culture, you don't want to be dragging that cat around your shelter, and what you do is you go and examine it. If you do, don't find lesions on repeat exam, and you don't find anything on your wood lamp, the cat's probably a fomite culture. And you can reculture it to, to be sure, but I would prophylactically dip it with lime sulfur. And an example here is dip it and let it go. I mean, it was a fomite carrier. But if you come back and two weeks later this cat has lesions, well, what you had two weeks ago was a cat that was just starting to incubate lesions, just starting to shed spores. You couldn't see the lesions, and now you do. You can find them on your exam. You can find them on your wood lamp. Pluck some hairs. You can confirm it that way, that cat's infected. And, you know, so that's very helpful. So really the P-score system does help us a lot with, with looking at fomites and sorting cats out. P3 cats are kind of a different story. When they've got a lot of colonies on the plate, whether they actually have lesions or just a lot of fomite carriage, they need to be treated because they represent a risk to the population. And so that's how we use our P-scoring system. And that's really detailed in the Shelter Medicine Infectious Guide textbook um, and in also um, a little bit in some of the resources. As far as treatment goes, there's three types of groups of cats that you as a shelter person have to deal with. Simple infected cats that are otherwise healthy with lesions and are going to do great. These cats do well because they don't have problems. Complicated infection groups. Sometimes these are really emotional cases. The cats have got a lot of lesions, they've got matted hair, um, they've got upper respiratory disease, they're feral. So something about them just makes it complicated, and it makes a decision on how to treat them complicated. Um, and then there's lesion-free with culture-positive cats, and those are ones that you really have to decide. Was this, is this cat one that is a fomite carrier, um, or it was lesion-free when I cultured it, but is it lesion-free now? And so those are the three basic groups of cats that you do and you use your your design your treatment plan with. So in looking at your treatments for shelters, basically it is not a complicated situation in looking at treatment options. You have to use a topical. You have to use a topical because any systemic drug will not reach out to the tips of the hairs and kill spores. You have to kill the spores on the hair coat. You don't want them to fall into the environment. Right now there's only two products out there that we know work very well. One of them is lime sulfur, and the other is enoconazole. The second thing you need to do is use a systemic antifungal. And the two drugs of my choice are itraconazole or terbenafine. I was solely an itraconazole fan for a long time until I spent a year working with a shelter that was using terbenafine. And we found out that the best way of using terbenafine is daily, once a day in a 21-day course with a twice-a-week application of lime sulfur. So in a nutshell, 
twice a week dip and a minimum of a 21-day course of drugs. Some of you have emailed me and asked about week on, week off treatment because that's what's in Europe. And that may be fine, but unless you can be sure the cat's going to get its medication and there's going to be no confusion, is this the cat's week on or the cat's week off, I don't recommend it. I actually like, you know, this is the cat's bottle. It's got 21 pills. Make sure everybody gets everything. So bottom line, twice a week with your topical and at least a three-week course of infection. Now, if you can only afford one treatment, as Dr. Newberry says, go for the wet and smelly, and that would be lime sulfur. And I am a huge fan of lime sulfur, and I find it to be really, really effective. And it is one of the oldest treatments that's ever been used for ringworm. Um, it's used at a 1 to 16 dilution, um, and that's 8 ounces in a gallon of water. So, And that, to properly mix it, you, put, you have to shake the bottle because it settles out, and that's one of the things that can be a complicating factor for nuts for lack of efficacy, is you put eight ounces in a gallon of an empty gallon and then fill it to a one gallon, mix it up, and you use warm water, and you go ahead and use it fresh. It has to be used fresh and discard the excess. Now, um, it, some of you may be aware that lime, there's veterinary products of lime sulfur and there's also horticultural products. They are exactly the same thing. I am not advocating in any way to use any other, any other product other than a veterinary approved product, but someone listening to this may come from a country where the only availability is a horticultural product. They are the exact same thing. They're labeled a little bit differently, but they have the same concentration of lime sulfur, and it is still eight ounces in a gallon. How you apply it is an art form. Garden sprayers will work really great. Um, some people like the, the bucket method. I don't care as long as the cat comes out completely orange and totally drenched to the skin. What is most important is thorough, thorough application. Now, treatment failures. In order to deal with a treatment failure, you really need to get some eyes on it. And that means that if you've got treatment failures or you suspect it, you need to go and stand and watch. The first thing to look at is, do you have improper mixing of topical antifungals? Um, are they mixing it right? Look to see, are they shaking the bottle? Are they putting eight ounces in an empty gallon and then filling it up? Or are they filling up a bucket and tossing in some, some lime sulfur? Are they wetting the cats prior to application? Because that's a big no-no. Lime sulfur works the following way. It, you apply it to a dry cat, it adheres to the coat, and then as it dries, and especially after it dries, it gives off little vapors, antifungal fumes. That's why I like it so much. It works not just when it's wet, but when it's dry. And so if you wet the cat, it rolls right off. Matted hair. Maybe you got to clip some of the areas on the cat. I'm not a big fan of clipping because of thermal burns um, and thermal injuries and the problem that you sometimes have to sedate them, but in some cases you do. Are they applying everything, the entire cat? you got to watch for the face. Maybe it's your systemic. Maybe you've, you're using compounded itraconazole and maybe there's a problem with the compounding. That can help. Maybe the cat has an underlying medical problem that didn't show up when you first decided to treat. Do you have, and this is probably the biggest one, environmental contamination causing false positives? If you're not cleaning the rooms with the aggressive cleaning, you can be getting some really, really conflicting results. And a big clue there is if you've got cats that are going positive, negative, positive, negative on your cultures. And sometimes in group housing, um, you can have an infected cat running around that you don't that you don't know, and it could be the most gregarious cat, or it could be the most difficult cat to treat. Any one of those. When we talk about treatment monitoring, this is something I get again a lot of calls on, and I'm going to tell you the most effective and the least expensive way of monitoring cats is to do weekly fungal cultures. And boy, that doesn't sound rational, but if you stop and think about it for a moment. Calculate out your animal care days and calculate how much it costs to do a single fungal culture. They're about the same. One day, you know, whatever the cost is for a cat per day, it's usually about the same as a fungal culture plate. Now, if you start culturing at week four and then you wait for those results three weeks later, what are you doing during those next those week four to week seven? You're dipping the cat. You're medicating the cat. Your people are using consumables or you've got them in some kind of isolation. And then at week four, 
if you get a negative culture and you're trying to get a second one, you get another three weeks where you're waiting. Well, versus if you culture them weekly, you can monitor them more intensely and you can get them out of whatever treatment facility you're using, you know, anywhere from like two to four weeks sooner. And that's big on a cat that you're trying to get into a loving home. And you can also detect a lot of problems in application, um, you know, problems at um, fomite carriers. Um, and it's also hugely helpful to your staff that are trying to, to treat these cats because they can see the numbers going down. They can see the results every week. And people become really invested in it. And it's really important. So with all that said, one day you come back from vacation and somebody yells, there's an outbreak of ringworm. Or maybe it's a Monday morning or it's a busy Friday, and they yell, there's an outbreak of ringworm. And you go, oh, no, what do I do? Well, this really is not the panic situation that everyone makes it out to be um, because the first thing you want to do is tell everyone to sit still and don't move any cats because just because someone says, you know, you know the sky is falling doesn't necessarily make it true. And the second thing you do is you need to instruct your staff to start aggressive cleaning. Every bit of cleaning you do and every bit of cleaning that I'm big on is good for ringworm and it is also good for getting rid of other diseases. So tell everyone to get in there and do really aggressive cleaning because if you do have an outbreak, right there is a way to stop the spread. You are actively getting involved in it. And you do that daily and using whatever you're using as your disinfectant daily until a decision has been made. And meanwhile, you need to go and collect information for the veterinary visit and assessment. And so what are you collecting? Okay, this is everything. Make a map. Make a flow chart of how the cats move around. Collect inf interview people. What clinical signs were noted and when? Get a, a timeline. Is it limited to a group of cats or, you know, or a litter of kittens? A litter of kittens in a, you know, doesn't make an outbreak. It makes a litter of kittens with, with ringworm. Do staff have lesions? That would concern me a lot more if staff have lesions. So you really need to check on that, you know, and especially in places where you might be very commonly have lesions, like on your arms or where people are snuggling kittens under their, under their neck. Um, what diagnostics were done? You know, get that information for who's ever helping you. Have you done a woods lamp, a direct exam? How was it confirmed? Did they just call it red based on if you're doing it with a fungal culture? Was, is, is it red making it positive? Well, we know that's not the case. You have to do it microscopically. What kind of fungal culture media were you using? You know, because possibly that might be part of the problem. And look at your fungal culture media. I once had dealt with an, what was supposedly an outbreak of every cat positive, and what would happen was is the fungal culture medias were invaded um, by a storage mite from dog food causing the problem, and it caused all the plates to turn red. None of the cats were infected. We could have had a disaster if that hadn't been found out. Um, keep your plates. Keep your cytologies. You know, and, and find out what have you done so far and get that information together. Um, and then you can make an intelligent decision as to do you have an outbreak and then start sorting things out. So in summary, you know, when you're looking at ringworm and trying to battle it, look what your shelter can do and do what you can do well. Cleaning and decontamination and clutter busting is something everybody can do and it benefits every single infectious disease that we battle. Become really competent with a woods lamp and the best place to start is with a litter of infected kittens. And then, you know, pluck some hairs and get really practiced at looking at them directly. On top of that, um, what you can do is, you know, for training, if you've got a bunch of infected hairs, you can put them between, sandwich them between two dry glass slides and scotch tape them together, and they will glow for a couple of years. And then you can use them to refresh your own memory if you're looking for them or in training. It really becomes very helpful. And that will also help you in an outbreak because you may be able to answer your own questions by, with your wood lamp as to what to do. All right. So in full disclosure, I have to tell you I work for the University of Wisconsin, which you all knew. Um, and my funding has come from the Wynn Foundation, Companion Animal Grant, Maddie's Fund, thank you very much, DVM Pharmaceuticals, Novartis Animal Health, um, uh, Pfizer, and most importantly, and probably the biggest source, are lots of gifts from private individuals who have allowed me to answer questions and have allowed me to, to do some studies that I've just mentioned that I would like to do. And um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to everybody there. 
And so I think that sort of stops my, um, I'm done. Well, we have, <laughs> Lynn, a, we I'm have done. A, well, we have a few questions, Dr. Moriel, so okay. don't go anywhere. Oh, I'm not going um, anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we can get the first question up here for you. And this is a interesting one, I think. Our shelter has good luck with over-the-counter Lamisil for athlete's foot, jock itch, ringworm for people. It cuts down on time until the fur starts gro starting to grow back in about 10 days, two weeks. It seems less harsh than other products and is cheaper. Is it safe for your pet? Okay, Lamisil is um, the, 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 the train name for terbenafine. And uh, terbenafine is, is very useful. Um, there is... The problem with using it um, locally is that it will clear the local lesion, but it will often leave infected hairs in other areas. And so what will happen is, is the little lesions on the cat will go away, and the cat will clinically cure, but not necessarily cure um, the whole body. And so that's the problem with doing local treatment. The other problem with local treatment is that you are actually touching a cat with lesions, and that is putting you at risk for contracting it. Um, so um, that is a problem. Actually, no one has ever done a safety study on whether or not cats licking the Lamisil off is or is not um, safe. And when you read the label claim for Lamisil, it doesn't claim to cure it. It claims to control it for up to three months, which means that they kind of admit that it will come back, because in people, when people have ringworm, they treat you for six months. We're getting concerned about treating cats for three, you know, from anywhere from six to 12, to 12 weeks, or three, three months. But people, they need to do at least six months. All right, another question? Okay, next question. Well, it should be coming up in a okay. second. Okay, waiting for it. I seem to have lost my uh, Q&A box for some reason. You can read it to me. Uh, I can't even see it. <laughs> Dr. Okay. Moriello, so, uh, maybe some help from the back. I'm trying to push question number 38. Let's see if we can. Now, audience, don't worry, because all these questions are going to come to me, and I'm going to write out answers for them, for you, who's ever asked the question, and for everybody else, because if it's one question for one person, it's one question for everyone else. So I will, I will absolutely promise to answer them. And if I get anything on any other sources, I will post all that on Natty's for you, too. It's been a, a lot of fun working with you, and I really want to try to be helpful here. Oh, that would be great. Um, I think I can read this one to you. Okay. Our shelter, uh, let's see, uh, uh, wrong one. Hmm. That's one you just answered. Can you specifically address for the foster home-based rescues how to clean, disinfect after ringworm positive cat has been in a foster home? Now that's a good question. Oh, absolutely, and that's actually been um, a, a little bit of a study that um, I've been doing with a number of people, and particularly Dr. Maria Verbrugge here. Um, so, while someone's got foster kittens and they've got ringworm, they need to do the cleaning. They need to keep them confined, and I believe in reasonable confinement. So find a room that they can clean reasonably and don't have anything in there like an antique or rug or something like that that you can't clean. After the kittens have cured, go through there and clean thoroughly the, the place, you know, vacuum, scrub, everything. And then once it's done, do um, take some Swiffers, cut them into quarters, and take one Swiffer and do the entire lower level of, the, of, of everything sort of like below on the floor and collect that and Swiffer it, and you basically wipe it down, put it in a plastic bag, submit it for culture, then take another second Swiffer, and I call it the up Swiffer, Swiffer everything above it, and then submit that for culture. And what you're looking for simply is, you know, after I've done all this cleaning and after this cat has been there, am I call, am I, is my room culture negative? And by doing just two cultures, you'll know whether or not you've got a problem on the, on the ground level or whether it's above, you know, hairs got caught up in, in a picture or something. Who knows? And then if you've got that, then basically you go back and retreat and re-clean the room. And what I can tell you is that I've had shelter um, foster parents who have been so great at culturing that even when the cats were there, we could barely detect any contamination. And if somebody has been dutiful with keeping the cats confined and treating the cats appropriately, we have never encountered a home 
that we cannot get clean. You can, again, it's the M&M theory. It's, you, you, you just keep removing them. You know, you spill a ton of M&Ms on the floor, or worse, those little styrofoam peanuts, eventually you get them all, and you can do it. And, and you just do the, the two Swiffers, you know, up and down until, you, until it's clean. And so that keeps the cost down to the shelter, who's obviously probably doing these cultures for the, um, for the foster home. So you could, you could, you know, depending upon how well you're cleaning, you could have people um, retreating cats very shortly but probably minimally three weeks because you're going to be looking for the culture results uh, there because it will come up in between somewhere between 7 and 21 days. All right. Okay, one last brief question, and then we'll go to our closing remarks. If an animal has ringworm, are they immune from getting it again with so many spores being around and they don't come down with it? Oh, that's a great question. Um, once a cat gets ringworm, uh, they do develop immunity to it. Um, it is relative, so that means that if you get the, if a cat has had ringworm and then it gets really sick and really injured, sure, with enough spores you can get reinfected. But it doesn't protect them from mechanically carrying the spores. So that's why kittens are more likely to have lesions, and adult cats are the, likely the ones that are going to be the, um, the fomite carriers. And then I do see uh, the acel spray question up there. And I'd like to try to address that. Do sure. you recommend a cell spray directly on the body or as a dip? Um, a cell, which is one of the high, um, accelerated hydrogen peroxides, we have not had a chance to actually test it on cats. And that is going to be um, a project um, for this fall. So I'm going to actually have to probably come back to Natty's with a little update here on actually what we've done with some of these newer products. So, we, so I can't make a recommendation on something that I actually haven't done on on, on, on cats um, with, with Dr. Newberry or with whatever other shelter that I'm, I'll be working with. So, okay. Well, that's the end of our event tonight. What a great presentation. We want to thank Dr. Moriello and all of you for your time tonight. We hope you'll join us on September 27th and October 25th for our next webcast series on preventing and treating upper respiratory infections with Dr. Kate Hurley and Stress, Housing, and Enrichment with Dr. Sandra Newbury. We will email information to you on how to register for the webcast, and we hope to see you there. Please click on the link on your screen and take our survey. Survey. It may, it may have been blocked by your pop-up blocker, or it may be in a different window. If you can't see it, we'll be emailing the link to you. We would really appreciate it if you'd take a few minutes to respond. We hope you checked out the resources and the widgets at the bottom of the screen, but if you didn't get a chance during the presentation, we will email the links to you. We will also be sending the link to the archived version of tonight's webcast. Thanks again for being here tonight with us this evening. Good night. <laughs>